What's the mountain in your life? What's the mountain that needs to be moved? What is the mountain in your life that you are saying, it's never moved, it hasn't moved, it's not going to move, it never will move? What's the problem that's too big to solve? What's the, what's the challenge that's too big, seemingly too big for you to take on? Is it too big for God? God is in the mountain moving business, but you must not doubt. Jesus said, if you have faith like a mustard seed, God can move the mountain. Nothing will be impossible for you. A little bit of faith in a great big God is more than enough. God is more than enough. We want to focus on how big the mountain is. Jesus said, get your eyes off the mountain. Just focus on having a little bit of faith. Moving mountains. Can I ask you this question? Have you ever moved mountains? Have you ever done the impossible? And what mountains would you like God to move now? You know what I find? We all believe in God, but we don't do much mountain moving. I want you to look at what I consider to be one of the greatest promises of God found anywhere in Scripture. Let's read what the Scripture has to say. Mark chapter 11, starting at verse 22. And Jesus answering, saying to them, have faith in God. Now I have that underlined and highlighted in my Bible. Uh, remember, it's not us. It's not having faith in us. It's having faith in God that makes everything change. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye will so receive them, and ye shall have them. Now he wasn't talking about rearranging the topography or the geography of the area. He was talking with a figure of speech that we still use to this day. They used this figure of speech when something was so foreboding, so impossible, it was ridiculous to think anything could be done about it. Now we in our speech still use this. We say, I'm under a mountain of worry right now, a mountain of debt, a mountain of concern, a mountain of torment. And God says, I am the mountain moving God. Well, God says, I'm inviting you to be a mountain mover. God wants you to live with such an audacious, bold faith, a mountain moving declaration of faith that comes from your lips that causes the world around you to marvel. How does that happen? It starts with the words you speak. Mountain moving faith speaks. Mountain moving faith also though, prays. Mountain moving faith prays. Because I think we have to back up here and say, okay, where does the fuel for mountain moving faith come from? Where does the fuel for mountain moving faith, where will it come from? What will ignite the flame to believe God in a way that everybody watching you would say, that's foolish, that's unreasonable. And you can stand and go, no, the mountain will move. Where does that, where does the fuel for that come from? Look at verse 24. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be done for you or it will be yours. If your words aren't faith filled, then you need to back it up and go, how much time am I really spending with God? Because the more time you spend with God, the more faith filled your words get. This is why Jesus again and again and again talks about the importance of asking. So you go to Matthew chapter seven, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and it will be open for you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? 
Then you go to John's gospel. And in John's gospel, Jesus again and again and again talks about asking, John 14, whatever you ask in the name, in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Here's the thing, when you don't ask God, it, it diminishes the glory that God gets through your life. Take stock of that for a minute. But he gets glory through you bringing your need to him and saying, God, I recognize that you're the one who can meet this need. That glorifies God. It makes him look mighty. It makes him look awesome. It makes him look powerful, which he is. But it puts that on the screen of your life. John chapter 15, verse seven, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Chapter 16, until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, 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 and you will receive that what? That your joy may be full. Two results of you asking that Jesus points to in John. God gets glory and you get joy. God gets glory and you get joy. When you ask your good, perfect, holy, heavenly Father to do what only He can do for you, it glorifies Him and it fills you with joy because it reminds you of how good He is. How good He is. That He will marshal the resources of heaven to provide for His children. Jesus says it's prayer. It's prayer that fuels a faith-filled declaration because public power always follows private prayer. Public power always, always follows private prayer. This is true in the ministry of Jesus. It was true in the life of the apostles. It's true throughout the pages of scripture and it's true in your life. Much with God, he's much with you because he wants mountains to move in your life. He wants it to happen. First of all, if you want to move a mountain, Jesus said, pray. He makes it very clear. He says, you need to pray and ask for these things from God. A lot doesn't happen because we never ask, we don't believe. Mark 6, 46, and when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Before you can move mountains, you need to have a mountain of prayer. You need to be living a life of prayer if you want to move mountains. The day you want to move a mountain cannot be the first day you start praying. He said, Matthew 7, 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. Or to him who knocks it will be opened. And the words there, asking, seeking, knocking, it's talking about continued effort. Or what man is there among you whose son asks for bread? Will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those that ask him? So notice, ask, 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 seek, seek, knock, knock. Pursue these answers, these miracles. So we need to pray, not only in the good times, but in the bad times. But we need to have lives of prayer. That's one of the keys. And you can have an earth-shaking experience and move mountains. Now the devil's gonna try to get you stopped from the get-go because the devil's not worried about us till we get prayer rolling. And then the devil's defeated and there is nothing more powerful than prayer. It's the most powerful thing in the universe because it moves the arm of the Almighty, the God with whom nothing is impossible. But he says, here's the first key. Number one, you gotta ask. You gotta ask. Be thou removed. Whoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed. Verse 24, therefore I say whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe. You gotta ask. What are you asking for that's out of bounds, possibly? Something you say, only God could do this. Only God. What exactly are you asking for? Now he says, you have not because you ask not. Has anybody ever watched you or me ask in faith believing for the impossible? Or are we just too comfortable playing it safe? Do you have any idea how powerful an ask is with God? Ask. 
You want to move mountains? Ask. What would you like to see God do? When we get to heaven, I'm afraid the Lord's going to say to me, David, you asked for so little. Didn't you read these passages? Do you not understand? I'm all powerful. Listen to what the scripture says. Matthew 19, 26, with men it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Mark 9, 23, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Mark 10, 27, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Luke 18, 27, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. God says, there's nothing I can't do. I am all powerful. What do you want in your marriage? How do you want your life to be used? Ask, ask in faith believing. He said, if you have the faith of a grain of mustard seed, that'll do it. You can't do it, but he can. How can this mountain ever move? How can this complicated situation ever change? How, can, how, how could this ever be turned and become a blessing? How can, how can this be? How? It's, it's a question that's been asked probably a billion times. How? How can this be? How, how can this be done? How can I get through this? How is this ever going to, how is this going to work out? How will this ever be changed? How? God knows how. It's profound, but simple. As mind boggling as it seems to us, he knows how. He knows how to do what we can't do. He knows how to make happen what we can't make happen. What is impossible with us, He knows how to do. God knows how to do miracles. I don't know how to do miracles, but God does. He knows how to give victory when we can't see how. He knows how to provide when we can't see how. Don't worry about the how. He knows how. Even something never been done before, God knows how. He's done a million firsts. He's done millions of never been done before. Think about it. Millions of never been done before. You name it, he knows how. He knows how to set you free. He knows how to forgive. He knows how to give you a brand new life, completely forgiven of sins. He knows how to be there with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He knows how to make life good again. God is bigger than my circumstance. He's bigger than who I am. I will trust him. Even though you can't see how, he knows how. Many of you are going through storms. Maybe a storm on your job, storm in your marriage, storm with your kids, storm with your parents, storm with your physical being, storm with your finances. Storms that we don't invite, storms that come from people we think that love us, storms that come from seemingly nowhere, but there they are. So what do you do when everything you trusted in collapses in a storm? How do you prepare for a sudden change in your life? And how do you recover when life hits you on the blind side? And some of you know what that feels like. What do you do after a lifetime of hard work and dedication and commitment and loyalty? How do you change your vocation and skills suddenly when they release you from your job? When all your skills that you learn, they don't need anymore. What do you do when the rug is pulled out from under you, as we all know is happening to so many people? How do you face the family you once left behind? 
to go back home because you couldn't pay the rent and that mortgage and you have to go live with your parents again. The storm has many origins. The answer is only one. You can't bring anything to God that's too big for him. You cannot. You can't bring anything to God that's too heavy for him. He can handle it. You can't bring anything to God for which he does not have a perfect answer every single time. He will make your way clear. He will give you a sense of confidence and boldness and assurance that you can stand anything that comes your way. And sometimes God allows very difficult situations in our life to do what? To grow us up. And I don't think that if God allows a storm in your life, that His ultimate purpose is to bring you out stronger. A storm, this kind of trial, is an unexpected circumstance that invades your life where you don't know if you're going to make it or not. But let me tell you something else about a storm. A storm is always designed to increase your faith and give you a deeper experience with your God. Storms aren't pleasant, they aren't comfortable, and sometimes they can be life-threatening, but they always come with a purpose. A storm in your life can destroy you, or it can develop you. It can build your strength, your wisdom, your knowledge, your understanding, your commitment, your devotion, your faith your serenity, your peace, your joy in your life. That is, some storms, when God gets through working them into our life, we're just so much better off. We're cleaner, we're purer, there's more peace, there's more joy, because you know you're in the center of the will of God. So sometimes they develop us, sometimes they destroy us. He doesn't want a storm to destroy us. And the truth is only when we allow Satan to get a grip on us in the times of difficulty, will it happen? All kinds of storms come and they come in different seasons in life. But what I like about life is God says that as long as the earth endures, there'll be seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter, and there'll be day and night, and these will never cease. God says as long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest time. There will be some dark nights, but there will be days coming afterward. There will be winter, it'll be cold, but I promise you, he says, there will be summer. Some of you are in a season of plenty right now, others broke. But let me tell you something about seasons. If you broke now, I guarantee you can't be broke forever. In other words, seasons are controlled by God. That makes me very comfortable. Because whether it is raining or sunshine, God is in control. Ecclesiastes 3 says, To everything there is a season, and to every purpose there is only a time under heaven. In other words, everything is seasonal. That means that no matter what you go through, it cannot last. Seasons are important because seasons guarantee change. Seasons give hope. Nothing remains the same in a season. Seasons are always temporary, and the key to life is outlasting the season. In other words, seasons are always moving and never respond permanently to a temporary problem. This is very important because when you are in a dark moment, sometimes you think that that's a permanent address. But never make a permanent decision to try and solve a temporary problem. This is what happens in divorce many times in, in, in a marriage. You go through a very tough moment. I mean hell on earth. Believe me, you got a choice. Am I going to make a permanent decision at this point? Or am I going to outlast this season and, and make it through this dark moment? It happens with friendships. It happens with even jobs. It happens with business. Sometimes you want to quit the business. Life is so tough. But everything is seasonal. And that's the encouragement of life. God never wants your circumstances. He doesn't want you to deny them. A storm is a storm. You don't call it a sunshine day. A storm is reality. But he never wants your circumstance to trump his word. Not only does he not want your circumstance to trump his word, he doesn't want your circumstance to trump his presence. 
because he's on the boat too. And so Jesus speaks to the problem and when he speaks to the problem, there is a circumstantial change. Trials, as inconvenient and as painful as they are, are a journey of discovery of who you're dealing with. And no matter what you're going through, you can mark this down. There is a promise in the Word of God that will match what storm you're going through. This infinite God of ours, who gave us the revelation of Himself, because He's omniscient, he, watch this, He knew every single kind of storm that could ever come upon humanity, from Adam and Eve in the garden to this present day until He comes back and wraps it all up. He knows all about all storms. So therefore, when He gave us His Word, how many storms does His Word cover? All of them. You cannot think of one He does not consider. Know that storms are natural. Stop being shocked that things are tough. Can I say it again? Stop being shocked that things are tough. Stop being shocked that you lost your job. Stop being shocked that the business is going through a tough time. Why? Storms are natural. Storms are temporary. There's no permanent hurricane. There's no permanent earthquake. There's no permanent tsunami. There's no permanent cyclone. They're all temporary. Storms confirm how strong you are. No matter how much you claim you got faith, storms will test whether you get it or not. Storms reduce you to God again. Well, what anchors you? When a storm hits you, what anchors you? Or do you just drift along with it? The Word of God is our anchor. Now think about this for a moment. Storms are inevitable. Our anchor is immovable. It doesn't move. It doesn't change. It anchors us solid to the rock of Christ. The Word of God anchors our storm. Now watch this. Because He is omniscient, all-knowing, He knows where I am in the storm. Because He's omnipresent, He's with me wherever I am in the storm. And because He's omnipotent, He has the power to bring me through the storm. That is the anchor. How do I know that's the anchor? Because that's who the Bible says He is, that He is all-knowing, that all presence is in His presence, and He's all-powerful. You may not feel very strong. You may not feel very powerful, but you can be wise. And the wise thing to do is to anchor your life on the rock of God's unchanging truth. What are you building your life on? You building it on pop culture? You build it on personal opinion? Or are you building it on the unchanging rock of God's eternal truth? Whether you build on sand or rock, the storms come to both houses. Christ was saying, look, whether you're in a secure house or a shaky house, the storm don't care. It's coming. Expect the storms to come. Everybody will face storms. That's what Christ is saying. Whether you are built on the rock or the sand, the storms come against you. If the storm hits everybody, then the issue in life is not storms. Don't worry about the storm. It come in anyhow. You got to focus on something else. In other words, storms come to expose what you built on. You got to focus on, am I built in the right way? The structure is more important than the storm. In other words, you are never remembered by what you avoided in life. You are remembered by what you were survived. Never trust the person who ain't been through no storm. Why? Because you are not remembered by what you avoided. How do we know David? Goliath. How do we know Joshua? The wall. How do we know Samson? The Philistines. How do we know Moses? Pharaoh. If you ain't got no problem, you ain't got no reputation. A calm sea never produced a good sailor. How would you like to go on the seas with a sailor who had never been on troubled seas? If you're going to have a good life, it means you're gonna go through stuff. But the purpose of that stuff isn't to harm you. God allows it or causes it to grow you up. 
to grow me up. What do you got to know? First of all, he says you got to know that the testing of your faith develops what? Perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work in your life so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking anything. The only way to live a life of no lack is to be tested by storms. And he says, have pure joy when they come. Because you know that this storm is going to leave you a better person, a stronger person with more stable perseverance. In other words, don't leave the class. Stay in the class until perseverance has its complete work. A storm can put you on the shelf so that you never used of God, or it can equip you to be a fantastic servant of God. It's our response. And our response is determined by a number of things, one of which is our view of God. How do, how do you see God? If I see God as this legalistic, strict God who's just chalking off my bad points, or do I see him as a God of love and compassion and kindness and forgiveness and purpose and desire to use you in some fashion, some way? How do you see him? How do you, how do you picture God? That is, when you think about God and you're a child of his and you've been saved, how do you picture him? Is he, in other words, is he on your side? Or is he on the side of something else? Do you see him behind these storms with anger? Or do you see him an awesome loving God sending into your life something that you don't like? He knows you don't like it, but he knows it's best for your life at this moment in time. How do you see him? If somebody says, well, what is God like? If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Here's what Jesus said. If you have seen me, you've seen the Father. He was not talking about physically. He's talking about who he is, the person. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. I only do those things that I see the Father doing. And so let me ask you a question. What is it about Jesus that some of you do not like? What is it about Jesus that you don't like? I'd, I'd like somebody to tell me, somebody who doesn't believe in him. Well, just tell me what is it about him you don't like? What did he do wrong? Zero. When the storm comes, he says, he will not allow you to be what? Tested beyond what you can bear. So if, you, if, if he allows it, he trusts you. A storm is a message from God about what he thinks about you. And if you lost your house, God, you, you can handle a lost house. Why? I got another one coming bigger than that. In other words, every storm that comes is God saying to you, go girl, you can handle this. Come on son, you can handle this. I won't allow it if you couldn't handle it. That means if it comes, you got what it takes to overcome it. So sometimes what appears to be storms in our life may be a storm. But on the other hand, the question is, what's God doing in the storm? And you can mark this down. Whatever the storm is, he is at work. He's at work in the storm. He's up to something good in every single storm, if we'll just trust him. We are all sailing across the sea of life. Some of you are in a great storm right now. Listen closely. God didn't promise smooth sailing, but he did promise that you're going to reach the other side. Some of you have lost your jobs. Some of you are going through marriage crisis. Some of you are experiencing business failures or business reversals. Some of you are going through a time of family illness. Some of you have experienced unexpected tragedy that's stricken like lightning striking you out of a clear blue heaven. But what can we learn from chaos? What can we do to survive the coming storm? What to do? when you feel like you're going under, when chaos reigns, when fear grabs you by the throat and tries to drown you, what to do? Chaos doesn't mean that something is wrong with you. Chaos doesn't mean that God is angry with you, God doesn't love you, or that God has rejected you. 
Chaos does not mean that if you were in the perfect will of God, you wouldn't be in that storm. Let me tell you this very candidly. Chaos is a normal part of life and living. Struggle is the essence of growth and development. A mighty oak begins with a little seed that is planted in the soil and fights its way up only to face the winds, the rain, the snow, the blazing sun, and endless adversity year after year to become a beautiful, magnificent oak tree. Because it's only in the storm that your faith can grow. It's only when your faith is tested by fire that you really know how pure your faith is. It's only when you are tested that your character can develop. Only in the storm can you discover the power of God to deliver you. Only in the storm do you call upon the Lord and find Him to be the ever-present help in the time of trouble. The storm develops your confidence. And as your confidence is, so is your capacity. That means that God sent to David a lion to whip and then a bear to whip before he sent the giant. God has you fighting the fight you're fighting now because it's a fight designed to develop your confidence. And when you win this one, the next one will be a little bigger and you'll have the confidence because of your past victory. And when you win that one, you'll win the next one and the next one and the next one because God is transforming you into a lion of God because God doesn't answer instantly doesn't mean he's not going to answer because God's delays are not God's denials he's waiting for persistence to overcome resistance He's trying to develop in you the character of endurance. For those who endure to the end, the same shall be saved. The resistance of water is necessary for ships to float. The resistance of air is necessary for a plane to fly. The resistance of gravity is necessary for you to walk. God put you through a struggle to develop you into who you're going to be in the kingdom of God. God used no one in the Bible until he put them through the university of adversity before he allowed them to be a leader in the kingdom of God. You will have your adversity. You will reach the other side. But God is going to make a champion of grace out of every one of you. Listen to me. When you focus on the threat you will experience fear. When you focus on Jesus, you will experience faith. When you struggle, when you go through adversity, think about the possibility that God is using your struggle and your adversity. Every opportunity has difficulty and every difficulty has opportunity. It's only when you come to grips with a difficulty that you will realize your potential. Stop looking at your circumstance and start looking at your opportunity. The things you trust in today will fail you tomorrow. People will fail you. How many brides and grooms have walked the aisle of the wedding chapel, stood before God and made a covenant, and they put their complete trust in another person, and that person broke that covenant and broke their heart? How painful! How chaotic! What oceans of anger flood the soul when that happens? What madness! Where is God to allow something like that to happen? Listen, it's not the end of the world. In time, your heart will heal. The sun will shine again. You will sing again. You will love again. You may think there's no answer for me. Oh, God, God has a thousand and one answers you haven't thought of. Where do you go when the storms of life are greater than what you can endure? When the storms are great, when the winds and the waves are crushing your dreams, where do you go? You go to the one 
whom winds and waves obey. His name is Jesus. He is the rock. He is the Savior. It's 2.30 in the morning and you cannot sleep. You roll from one side to the other. You pound your pillow. Nothing helps. Everyone else sleeps, but not you. And so it's 2.30 in the morning, it becomes 3.30, and you still haven't slept. And anxiety begins to have its way with you. Another hour passes. You cover your head with a pillow. You feel like crying. What a mess. What does all this anxiety mean? All this insecurity, all this trepidation all this worry, all this restlessness, what does it mean? Well, it means simply this. You are a human being. You're not stupid. You're not emotionally underdeveloped. You're not immature. Your parents didn't fail you. It doesn't mean you failed them. And this is important. It does not mean you're not a Christian. Christians battle anxiety. Jesus did. In the Garden of Gethsemane on the night before his crucifixion, he prayed for the cup of suffering to be taken away from him. And he prayed with such ferocity that that the capillaries burst and and rivulets of, of crimson rolled down his face. Jesus battled anxiety. He faced fears, but he fought through his fears and surrendered them to God and fulfilled his mission. And anxiety did not win. And such is God's plan for you. Anxiety comes with life, but it doesn't have to dominate your life. God's plan for you is not a life that is drenched in anxiety. It is his will that you and I learn to live a life that is characterized by calm and not chaos, by peace and not panic. You ever felt nearly swamped in your life? Like, I'm still showing up, but barely. I'm making it and I'm smiling, but nobody knows what's really behind this smile. The things I think about, some days I just want to run away from it all. I want to suggest something to you today about the storms of anxiety in your life and the waves and the winds that are blowing in your life. Because, man, the winds will blow. They will blow. Absolutely. And the waves will break and they will crash. No doubt about it. There are some things that you're afraid of that make no sense from heaven's perspective. There are some things that are causing you to shut down, they are paralyzing you, that are senseless when you put it in the context of who God is in you and what you mean to him. And he says, I want you to train your your heart to be anxious for nothing. If you're following after God's purpose, you got no reason to ever be anxious. Be anxious for nothing. How can, some, can somebody really live a life in which they're anxious for nothing? Do not let yourself be caught in a state of perpetual anxiety. That's what he's saying. It's impossible to lead a life free of anxiety, but we can discover a life that is void of perpetual anxiety. Anxiety comes with life, but it does not have to dominate our lives. You see, anxiety, depression, and unhappiness, they all come from a sense of powerlessness. They all come from a sense of powerlessness. So when you're powerless, you feel anxious. When you're powerless, you feel depressed. When you're powerless, you feel unhappy. So the, the idea that, that you're powerless over your debts, powerless over the sentence, powerless over the battle, that somehow it's up to you to try to make it happen, that will bring you sadness. It will bring you 
anxiety. It will bring you. So we only get anxious about something because we're not certain about what the outcome is going to be. Why would you be anxious about something you're sure about? You know, when you're rooting for your favorite team, when it's live and it's happening and they're and the game is really close and it's down to the last minute, you get anxious about it. It's just an example that that just is, shows how our emotions operate. You understand the anxiety when you when, when it's close and when it's on the edge because you're not sure. But let me ask you something. If you already know and if you're watching, you would have no anxiety. Why? Because you already know the outcome. Right. See, you have no fear and no anxiety when you know the outcome. Well, the outcome of whatever your need is, is my God shall supply it. So when you know the outcome, anxiety leaves you. There's a pathway out of the valley of fret. And God has used the Apostle Paul to sketch the map in this passage from Philippians chapter four, verses four through eight. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be made known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Person would be hard pressed to find a passage more practical and applicable to our day and age, wouldn't you agree? So, what can we do? Paul lists here four helpful ideas for winning the war on worry. And if you want to move from chaos into calm, consider what Paul says. First, celebrate, celebrate God's goodness. Rejoice in the Lord always, the apostle writes, with chains dangling from that Roman jail cell. Rejoice in the Lord always, he writes, with no penny in his pocket. And perhaps the sound of the footsteps of the executioner in the hallway. Rejoice in the Lord always, he writes, beneath the shadow of Nero and the threat to the church. He says, not just rejoice in the Lord always. His point is, don't meditate on the mess. The more you stare at the problem, the bigger it gets. The more you stare at the problem, the bigger it gets. So when you have a problem, lift up your eyes and rejoice in the Lord. The minute the anxiety comes, rather than giving in to the anxiety, you lift up your eyes and you rejoice in the Lord. This was the counsel of the psalmist. He said, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Do you see the intentionality in those words? I will lift up my eyes. This was the decision that the psalmist made. The apostle Peter is a testimony to this. You remember how when the storm struck the Sea of Galilee, he knew what 10 foot waves could do to a fishing boat. And Peter cried out, Lord, if it's really you, then command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. And Peter left the boat and walked on the water to Jesus. But when Peter saw the wind and the waves, he became afraid. And he began to what? Sink. As long as he kept his eyes on Christ, he was able to do the impossible. But when he saw the wind and the waves, when he turned his gaze away from Christ, he began to sink. If today you feel like you're sinking, or the next time you feel like you're sinking, lift up your eyes, set your gaze on Christ, rejoice in the Lord, rejoice in his sovereignty. Is God greater than your problem? Has God ever faced this problem before? Does God have solutions you've not thought of? Has God got you through these types of things before? Does God have a good track record? Is God strong? Is God sovereign? Is God still on the throne? Is he overall? See how you lift that up? You're rejoicing in the Lord. You're lifting your mind away from the problems and you're setting your mind on the one who can solve it. Do not meditate on the mess. So you rejoice. That's what it means to rejoice in the Lord. Oh, I've got a great God. 
I've got a wonderful father. I rejoice in the Lord. And then the apostle says, having done that, you'll be ready to ask God for help. You've calmed yourself down. Now you ask God for help. Let your requests be made known to God. You see, fear triggers either despair or prayer. So choose wisely. God said, call on me in the day of trouble. Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. The path to peace is always paved with prayer. That's why the devil doesn't want you to pray. The path to peace is always paved with prayer. The enemy, Satan, would love to shut down your ability to pray in faith. When you pray and you take a promise of God and you declare it over your life in whatever area, okay, the Bible says to believe you have received it. Worry does not believe that. Anxiety does not believe that. The cares of this world do not believe that. And the enemy will attack anything that you stand in faith for. And he would love, even if in your everyday life, for you to start worrying about things that you never worried about before. When you offer a request to God, do you tell God, now God, I'm just going to stay around till you get it fixed. If you need my advice, I'm going to be putting you on the clock. I'm going to check in with you. No. You leave your concern with your heavenly Father. And consequently, where that anxiety has gone, you can now place gratitude. Gratitude. Look what the apostle says. He says, In everything by prayer and supplication, with what? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Anxiety and gratitude cannot share the same heart. Test me on that. Try it sometime. The next time you're anxious, begin to make a list of things for which you're grateful. Because anxiety and gratitude refuse to share the same heart. So you leave your concerns with him. You fill your heart with gratitude. And then lastly, meditate on good things. Don't let anxious negative thoughts take over your mind. You cannot control your circumstances, but you can control how you think about them. Peace comes from a stream of thinking, from a stream of thinking, because you could be a Christian, be born again and on your way to heaven, but have no peace. Why? Because of what you're thinking, because of what you're meditating on, because of what you're dwelling on, what you're focusing on, what's going through your ear, you know, in between your ears, what's going on in your head in between your ears. Listen. This is why so many Christians fail is because they're trying to obtain and struggling for a victory that Jesus has already given. You see, if, for example, if you think about one of the things he promised he would do for you is it says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. If your mind is constantly on the fact that God will supply, you will have peace. So you could have all the money you need and not have peace. But you could you could have an empty bank account and have peace because you believe the promise that he will supply. You see, the peace doesn't come from the money in your account. The peace comes from your thought and your mind focused on what God said he would do and your confidence that he will do it because he's done everything else that he said he would do. Some years ago, I wrote this in a journal. I read it quite often. Today, I will live today. Yesterday has passed. Tomorrow is not yet. I'm left with today. So today, I will live today. Relive yesterday? No. I will learn from it. I will seek mercy for it. I will take joy in it. But I won't live in it. The sun has set on yesterday. The sun has yet to rise on tomorrow. Worry about the future? To what gain? It deserves a glance and nothing more. I can't change tomorrow until tomorrow. Today I will live today. I will face today's challenges with today's strength. I will dance today's waltz with today's music. I will celebrate today's opportunities with today's hope. Today. 
May I laugh, listen, learn, and love. And if tomorrow comes, may I do it again. The next time that anxiety awakens you at 2.30 in the morning, would you believe what I'm suggesting to you? And that is, it is not God's will that you lead a life of perpetual anxiety. That your Heavenly Father will help you. He will help you pull out the roots of your anxiety. He will help you deal with the fears that face you. With human tests, the key is knowing all the answers. But with God's test, the key is not knowing all the answers. With God's test, the key is trusting God to know the answer. You've got to trust God in the testing. Now in the Bible, a test is a trial that purifies and prepares the heart. A test is a trial used by God to purify and prepare the heart. You are being tested, always. You're being prepared. You're being purified. We're always being shaped. Again, if you fail to see this, then you'll interpret the challenges of your life as random issues that you just want to avoid. You'll try to avoid any challenge. Now, nobody gets excited about tests, but if you understand that you serve a master weaver who's going to weave all of this together, you will be able to discover that there is purpose in the troubles that come your way. For when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. God's goal on, on earth is not to make you happy. God's goal on your life is to grow you up to spiritual maturity. Happiness comes from holiness. And, and in heaven, you're going to be happy for trillions and trillions of years. This is the growing stage. This is the development stage. Not everything works perfectly, and not everything goes the way you want it to go, because God is much more interested in your character than he is your comfort. Now, one of the ways, one of the ways that God grows you up is by testing you. You know, when, when you work out in a gym, you, you test your muscles by lifting weights. And the more weight you can lift, uh, the more it tests your muscle, the more it grows your muscle. And God builds your character the same way, through a series of tests. And those tests test your faith, they test your character, they test your patience, they test all kinds of things in your life. Now the good news behind that is that there's a purpose behind every problem in your life. Problems are not simply arbitrary. Problems are not simply by chance. The problems that come into your life are there to test your character, to grow your character, to grow your faith, to help you become all that God wants you to be, the man God wants you to be, the woman God wants you to be. So every problem has a purpose and it's designed to help you grow. When God puts you to the test and you pass the test and he blesses you, watch this carefully. He's not coming back with a less struggle. The only way he's going to get your faith out there is to keep pushing. He, he tests you here, and what happens? The next time, the test is stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger because what's happening is it's like lifting weights. You start with two pounds, then you go to five, then you go to 10, then you go to 20, whatever it might be. You're getting stronger in your physical body when you extend the amount of weights. When you and I faithfully go through some test, some trial, and we come through it, we can thank God for it, but look, don't relax, because it, there's another one coming. He's not going to let you, allow you to stay where you are unless you push against him, push against him, push against him, and refuse to submit to the test. The test could be financial, it could be in your relationships to people, it could be with your job, whatever it might be. Whatever it is, remember this, that God's for you, he says he's working all things, listen, for our good if we trust him and rely upon him, one of his children. And so whatever the test is, it's for our good. We don't like them sometimes because they're costly. Sometimes they demand things of us that we don't necessarily want to yield. 
But if we want to grow and accomplish His purpose in our life, we must trust Him. So God has a will and a purpose and a plan for your life. And the reason He wants to grow your faith is because He knows the greater your degree of trust in Him, the more He's going to be able to, watch this, do through you, in you, and for you, as well as for the kingdom of God. That's why it's so very important that you and I learn to trust Him and to walk obediently before Him. Trust God during these times of testing. God has not forgotten you. God has not forgotten you. Do not interpret this time of testing as the absence of God, just the opposite. The Old Testament word for test comes from a Hebrew word that means to take a keen look at, to choose. To take a keen look at, to choose. So if you are being tested, it is because God is looking at you. He is choosing to prepare you for something in the future. But sometimes in the test, the teacher is silent. You don't hear anything. You don't see anything improving. But you have to know in the dark moments, God still has you in the palm of his hand. He knows it's difficult. He knows you feel overwhelmed. He knows you don't think you can go on. Don't worry, help is on the way. Weeping endures for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. Now keep standing one day at a time. Don't worry about tomorrow. You don't have grace for tomorrow. Stand today, and when you get to tomorrow, you'll have grace for that day. God is fully engaged. He sees the needs of tomorrow and accordingly prepares the test of today. He sees the needs of tomorrow and accordingly he prepares the test of today. How are you being tested? How are you being tested? Are you being tested emotionally? Are you being tested physically? Is your patience being developed? Perhaps a good question for you to ask your Heavenly Father is, Lord, what's this test for? Or how am I being tested? And perhaps you can even say, thank you, Lord. Consider it all joy, the scripture says, when you passed through various types of trials. You consider it, thank you, Lord, that you would consider me worthy of this test. But you press into the test of today. You trust God in a season of testing. And one more, you trust God for the timing. You may be in this test right now, the wind test, where you've been waiting for an answer and there doesn't seem like there's any end in sight. You're going, when? When, Lord? When are you going to take care of this problem? When are you going to take care of this issue? When are you going to take care of this relationship? When are you going to take care of my finances? When are you going to take care of my health? When are you going to take care of my future? And you're just going, when, Lord, when? Faith is waiting for God's timing without knowing when. Some of you have been waiting a long time for your prayer to be answered. Waiting a long time to be pregnant. Waiting a long time to be married. Waiting a long time for that boss to be fired. Waiting a long time. Just be patient. Trust God for the timing. God is always at work. God is always at work for the good of everyone who loves him. Our call is simply to wait while God works. You just keep trusting God in the testing. You just keep trusting God in the timing. To be sure, Joseph would be the first to tell you, life in the pit stinks. It does. But for all of its rottenness, it brings one beautiful blessing. When you're down in the pit, there's only one way to look, and that's up. You keep looking up. And the same God who reached in to rescue Joseph is the God who will reach in to rescue you. It may be taking longer than you thought. You were determined at first. You stood strong, but now it's been a long time. You're tired. Thoughts are telling you it's never going to work out. You'll never get well. Never see your family restored. Don't believe those lies. That test is not permanent. God has already set an end to the difficulty. You have to get your second wind. 
God didn't bring you this far to leave you. What he started, he's going to finish. Dig down deep and keep passing the test. Keep thanking him that it's on the way. Keep declaring what he promised. Keep believing when you don't see any sign of it. Stay in this attitude of faith. Faith is waiting on God's timing without knowing when. Faith is expecting a miracle without knowing how. Faith is trusting God's purpose without knowing why. Faith is continuing to persist without knowing how long. This is a test.